Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy and your grace toward us. Thank you, Lord, for creating a new creation and placing us in it, making us new creatures in you. Hallelujah. A whole new species of God-man in the earth. We just bless you, Lord, for your foresight, wisdom to lead us and to guide us, Lord into all truth and to reveal yourself to us as our heavenly father in yes. jesus name and everybody said praise the lord, praise amen. The lord. amen give the lord a hand clap this morning praise God. thank the lord amen thank you jesus praise god Sally and I were on the road yesterday. Uh, Uncle passed away. I mentioned it last Sunday, and uh, they live up in Humboldt. So Sally drove because she can, <laughs> and I rode, wishing I had driven. Praise the Lord! But no, I'm just kidding. no. She did a great job. It's a couple hours, a little over a couple hours up, and a couple hours back. But she did a good job, and I was just thinking of. how good God is to bring families into the faith, you know. Yes. Uh, he was my uncle, married my mother's sister, one of her younger sisters, and I've known him for over 60 years. They were married back in the 50s, and uh, he was a great guy, always upbeat. I don't know that I ever saw him in a bad mood. I'm sure he had him, but he didn't. I never witnessed any of it. A believer, and... Uh, it was just so good to be in that kind of an environment where, you know, we've all been in funerals where it's just sad. I mean, just yeah. so sad. But, and, you know, obviously we'll miss him and it, we'll grieve like all of us that have lost loved ones, you know. But, but it's so different when you know that this isn't the end. Amen. God has, you know, he's just moved on. In fact, even on the back of his uh, obituary he had written, you know, this isn't goodbye and I don't want everybody grieving. I know you'll grieve, but just let it go. I've moved on. This trip I have to take by myself, but we'll see again. We'll all see each other again. In the meantime, I'm having the time of my life. Yeah. So, God is good. Yeah. Amen. Just the peace that he gives us alone is worth everything. Yeah. Because when the worst thing happens, it's still a good thing. I mean, from a human perspective, just like Tim was saying, you die, but you can't kill me. You know, I'm gonna, I'm living on. I'm, I'm not going anywhere but to Jesus. Praise amen. the Lord. So, God is good, Amen. And uh, thank you for for being here this morning. It's great to know the Lord. I'd hate to hate to live my life and not have that assurance and that confidence amen. and that peace. Amen. This makes all the difference, especially in the world that we live in today, amen. that is so chaotic and upside down half the time. And, there's still some consistent, something that's solid, something that never changes. Amen. And that's our Lord. Praise God. So God is good. Amen. Yes. I have to preach a sermon on that sometime. <laughs> I have no idea what it means. i uh, just kidding. You know, I, I fix coffee. Cause I always get up before Sally. That's not a rap on her. It's just that she works harder. So, <laughs> I'm not as tired. I get up early. But I always you do get up early and so made coffee and she said, you know, this coffee tastes like mud. I said, well, Sally, it was just ground a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> when I say I make the coffee, what I mean is I push the button on the coffee pot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, keeping the kitchen theme going here, what do you, what do you suppose would happen if you threw a grenade into a French kitchen? the result would be linoleum blown apart. <laughs> Praise God. I'm so glad God is in a good mood. Amen. And he does protect us. You know, I got hit in the head with a can of soda the other day. Thank God it was soft drink. Okay. 
I can tell by the look on your faces, it's time to move on. Praise the Lord. We talked about it over the last couple of weeks. In fact, longer than that, but specifically, I've just mentioned the last couple of messages. We had one we were talking about how our connection with God brings heaven to earth. You know, how uh, it interfaces the two realms. Because we're a body, but we truly were a spirit. We just happen to live in a body. And so it's a way for God to interface or God to interact and uh, co-mingle, if you will, in this dimension. And still have access to it through humans. And we have access to the spirit realm through the spirit of God. So then there's the, we talked about last week, uh, that we, are we in Christ or is Christ in us? Both. Just like in the garden, you look at it and you think, Man, I, this is the way this thing looks. I can't tell if Adam's in a garden or if the garden is in Adam. You know, where's all this coming from? And it's the same way with this. Our relationship with God is so close, it's so one, that in the mind of God, there's no difference between heaven and earth in terms of where he is because he's in us all the time and we are seated with him in heavenly places. Can you see what he's trying to do is to get us to, to break down the walls of... Uh, the finite world that we live in to help us to see in the spirit realm so that we can bring that reality into this dimension. That's what changes other people's lives. Now we live, and when we have crisis and problems, obviously it's, it's troubling. But we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We, we, even when we're going through bad stuff, we know it's going to get better and God's going to see me through it. I've seen what he's done in the past and so on and so forth. And we have to be that kind of positive influence on the people around us if we're going to have the kind of impact that God wants to have. Because this is about what God wants to do. It's what God is doing in the earth. Amen? So with that in mind, let's go, let me start with Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. Hebrews 10 and verse 1. I'm just going to skip around a little bit here with scriptures uh, to begin with at least to kind of get us into the context of what I want to talk about. Praise the Lord. So for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So obviously, no matter how many animals they offered up, no matter how many sacrifices they made, they were never going to make you perfect. They would just cover, the, cover you from the judgment, amen, that was going to come, amen, and uh, that you deserve. But by the sacrifices, it would press, push that judgment back from year to year, right? So he's saying no matter how many of those, it wasn't going to happen. All right, verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So all of those 1,500 years of sacrifices are summed up in the one offering of Jesus Christ himself that took care of all the sin all the way back to Adam. And all the way forward to the coming of the, the second coming of the Lord or to our rapture. So the which will we are sanctified, we are set apart in God by the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. Verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So we know who are sanctified, that's us because we're believers. And then he says he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Just think about that for a minute. Perfect. We rarely get to use that word, I mean, truthfully. We use, we throw it around a lot, but I'm saying perfect is perfect. That means there is absolutely no flaw. Right. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. How many perfect things have you ever seen or done or been, you know? Yeah. We, we strive to try to get close, but not quite. One offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. So I'm looking at all of you that are born again, which I believe is everybody in this room, is perfect. Uh -huh. <laughs> Amen. I know. Caused you a little hiccup there, but it's the truth. He said it, right? Sorry. Our perfection is the result of Christ's redemptive work. Yes. Amen. Nothing we did. It's what he did. So look at Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Because this is the question that comes in your mind. What about this? What about we are to move on? Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. 
Right? It sounds like a contradiction from what we just read. We either we are already perfect or we're still trying to get to perfection, right? Let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Let us go on as if perfection uh, were a verb or something that we do. That's the way we normally read it or that's the way religious people have read it and then taught it, amen, to us. So... I get it. If it's a verb, I understand what they're saying. But the word perfection in Hebrews 6 and 1 is not a verb. It's a noun. Amen? In the original Greek, it's not a verb. It's a noun because if you have an interlinear uh, Bible that is Greek, Hebrew, and English, it gives you the literal word-for-word -word translation. And that word is, if you go to the strongest concordance, it's, it's, the root word is 3588. And from that comes the number 5046 in the Greek, which is... Telios. And telios is a noun. And a noun is a, a person, a place, or a thing. Right. right? A verb is an action, a noun is something. Right? right. Amen? A particular place or a thing. So perfection, according to this scripture, is a doing, is not a doing, it's a being. Yes. Mm -hmm. Alright? It's a person named Jesus. Yes. He's the noun that he's talking about. Perfection for us is recognizing that our perfection is based on who we are in, yes. not what we are doing. Right. You are no longer in the imperfect Adam. Amen. Amen. You are in Christ, the perfect one. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. Now this all is relative to what... Everyone's been saying here this morning already about how we cast out demons, how we take authority, how we do the things we do. We don't do it in our strength any more than Jesus did it in his human strength. He did it by the Spirit of God. I only do if He said, if the Father is one that's doing the work in me, I can do nothing of myself. So that's why we got to identify with the fact that we and God are one. That's why we're preaching the things we preached over the last few weeks. It's not just a get our ego up or to make us feel like we're something special, although we are something special, we're perfect, but it's to get us to get to that place of understanding and revelation to where we will actually walk out the power and the authority that we have in Christ. Yes. Yes. Amen. Perfectly accepted by God. Perfect in this world to do the works of God. Amen. So testing. He says testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. And I love this. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance is not against me. The repentance is toward God. Yeah. Amen? In other words, i got to change my mind about the way I understand God yes. in order for me to ever get to where God wants me to be. Yes. So it's repentance towards God. Change the mind about the way you understand God and the way your faith works towards Christ. And believe, just believe that it's finished. Believe that it's done, that you are perfect, that you are able to do all that God has called you to do and greater things than that, right? Repentance towards God. So change your mind, amen, about God. Now, we're going to read some scriptures here, but I want first I just to set this up a little bit. Under the Old Covenant, which we read about earlier here, knowing that all those sacrifices that were made never, ever made anybody perfect. They just kept pushing back the judgment for their imperfection to a later date until the perfect one would come, amen, and then receive the punishment that belonged to us imperfect people. He took our imperfection and made us perfect. Yes. That's, the, that's what he accomplished. Well, the priest under the old covenant was doing, going through these symbolic acts not to perfect anybody because it was impossible for him to do that because he had his own problems. He had to offer sacrifices for himself before he could ever offer any, for anybody else because he was imperfect. But it's all type and shadow. It's all symbolic, pointing us to the true high priest, amen, the one after Melchizedek, the king priest, amen, without beginning, without end. So it's all pointing us to Jesus. So everything that's going on back there is only a symbol of what truth Christ is going to bring to us, amen. amen. So a high priest does what? He offers sacrifices. Right? He enters into the holy place from the exterior, the, the open area, the, the court of the Gentiles, they call it, but it's where the laver was and so forth. Then they come into the holy place, and in the holy place there's the candlestick, 
the menorah, amen, the, the manna, the, the uh, altar of incense, right? And then after they would do their function within that area, based on those different articles of furniture, they would then go into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God. All right? So let's, with that in mind, let's look at some of these scriptures. Hebrews chapter 8 now, Peter, uh, verse 1 through 5. Hebrews 8, verse 1 through 5. I'm going to give you a, a math test this morning, but I won't be grading the paper, so don't worry about it. we just kind of mess with the head a little bit. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. All right, Ephesians chapter 5, or excuse me, Ephesians 1, verse 17 uh, through 23. Ephesians 1, 17 through 23. The God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, that filleth all in all. We've talked about those scriptures because God gave us that 15 years ago, whenever it was before, when we were still out at the old trailer park. And he's still revealing things to us from that scripture. We kind of just thought it was a good scripture. It was God. I mean, that's how he operates. Praise the Lord. So, last one here, Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Which is this mystery, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God, the saints, would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay? So God doesn't want this glory to remain a mystery. No. Praise the Lord. It was all throughout the Old Covenant because... God's Spirit couldn't dwell in anybody. We were still offering up types and symbols without the reality of the presence of Christ. Amen? So, God wants to unveil this mystery to us by pulling back everything that obscures our view. Everything that would cause us to not see clearly what God is trying to do in our lives in the church. Amen? Amen. He wants to do exactly what Don said. He wants to make eye contact. He wants to see face to face. Yes. Amen. Now look at Revelation uh, chapter 1 and we'll read verses 12 through 20. <clears throat> Revelation 1, 12 through 20. He says, I turned to see the voice that spake unto me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were like white wool, or like wool as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine, fine brass, as, a, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, 
I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death and of death. Write these the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the church uh, of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Praise the Lord. So John turns to see this where this voice is coming from, but he doesn't see the literal body of Jesus. He sees candlesticks and one standing in the midst of the candlesticks. Okay. Praise the Lord. Right? That's what it tells us. He turns to see who it is that's speaking, and I have a good idea that he knows it's the Lord because, after all, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ that he's given him. Hey, right? Right? And he, he looks, but he doesn't see a literal Jesus. What he sees is a candle, a menorah, yeah. right? A seven candle, candelabra as such. But the middle of it is a man. Mm. It looks like the son of man, you could say. Amen? All right, look at Ephesians again. 1, verse 22 and 23. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Revelation 1, 20 again. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So this... This revelation of Jesus isn't coming from, a, from some individual man, just somewhere off in space or in the heavenlies, however you want to define it, or up in the sky somewhere. That's not the revelation that he's getting. He didn't just see something and say, oh, Jesus. We just read what he saw. Yeah. And Jesus tells him what he's looking at. Mm -hmm. The symbolic picture that you're seeing is more than what you're seeing, in other words. This revelation is of Christ who is in the midst of the church. Yes. It's specifically from and through the church that Jesus makes himself fully known. Yes. Well, I got goosebumps. I don't know, but maybe because I know where I'm going here, but I'm just saying when he turned and looked, what he saw was the church. And Jesus smacked dab in the middle of it. Yes. Because the only way Christ could truly be revealed is by the church, which is why we have to get this understanding of who we are. That it's Christ in us and us in Christ. That we are the manifestation of God in this earth. We are His body. Yes. Praise the Lord. Exodus, look at this now. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 31. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Remember now, he's talking about the instruments that are going into the tabernacle or into the temple. Into the, into the tabernacle. Beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knot, and his flowers shall be of the same. In other words, he's just saying it's one hunk of gold and you're going to beat it into this candlestick. And on this candlestick will be all these ornaments. So this is a particular piece of furniture, the candlestick, and it, the scripture says it was made of one beaten work. One piece that was beaten into this piece of furniture, this candlestick. Now, can you just, can you see that this is talking about a description of the church? Right? Yes. It's one beaten work. And the beaten work doesn't mean, you know, that, that we're being abused or bruised by God. It's referring to a people who are the product of one who was beaten and bruised. Yes. We are all one in Christ. We come from Christ. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. That's what he's talking about. It isn't about us being beaten by God and whipped into shape. It's about us being the result or the product or the offspring of the one who was beaten and bruised. Amen. He was wounded for my transgressions, right? 
He was yes. bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement for my peace was upon Him. Amen? By His stripes yes. we were healed. Yes. Praise God. So, Jeremiah, look at this. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 29. Jeremiah 23, 29. Didn't care for the treats today, apparently. <laughs> it's not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. So the word of God in the hand of God is the instrument that God uses to accomplish his will. Yes. That's how we get born again. Yes. Yeah. Then we have God in us. We have Christ in us. And then we use the word of God to bring about the, w the will of yes. God and the word of God in our life. Yes. Right? It's like a, he's saying it's like a hammer. It produces. When, I, when it's used the right way, it's a tool of construction. It's a tool yes. that will produce something, amen, that couldn't be produced without it. Amen. Yes. The preaching of Jesus, the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the finished work of Jesus, it will it'll shape us. It will mold us into a candlestick. Yes. Amen. Yes. Like a natural hammer would on gold. Yes. Praise yes. the Lord. It will make people... It will make a people who will manifest the light of Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. John turns to see and he catches a glimpse of Christ, but also the vehicle that God uses to manifest the revelation of the finished work. Yes. Right? Yes. Jesus without his body is just a thought. It's just, it's just a, you know, a doctrine, a theory. Somebody has to make it alive. Somebody has to make it reality. Amen. And that's why we're here. That's why he comes to dwell in us. Amen. So Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. You are the light of the world. You're a candlestick. Mm -hmm. yep. You're a light of the world. A city that is hit, set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle... And then put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Praise the Lord. It's what we're talking about here, this eye contact, this loved ones, family members, people that we interact with that got issues, that have devils, that have, are, are either possessed or they are uh, held captive or in bondage to those demons. It's, we are the light. We're the thing that... Drives out the darkness, amen. Yes. They're in a kingdom of darkness and we're in the kingdom of light, which is the, the kingdom of His dear Son or the kingdom of Jesus. We have to bring light into a dark world and the only way we can do it is in the person of Jesus Christ as the body, individually and collectively. Yes. Praise the Lord. So, uh, look at Revelation again, chapter 1 and verse 20. So we're the light, we're a candlestick, we're supposed to be seen, we're supposed to be have an impact. We're supposed to have effect. So the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest the right hand, seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks sticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Alright? Back to Exodus chapter 25 and uh, verse 31. And we'll read 31 through 35, Peter. Exodus 25 Verse 31 through 35. I'll stay with me because this gets kind of complicated sometimes, but it's only because we're, we're just, we let it all come at us at once instead of just taking it line upon line. But. So thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, right? Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. This shaft, his shaft, and his branches, his bowls, his knobs, and his flowers shall be of the same. Six branches shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, three branches out of the candlestick of the other side. If you've seen menorah, there are different styles of menorahs. But the one they're talking about is the one that was in the temple. It's the typical Hebraic uh, menorah, which has a center candlestick with three candles on either side or three uh, works. So there's like seven lights going on here, which is a number of perfection for God, but it's also showing us the actual... Uh, construction of this particular piece of equipment or furniture. So the bowls made like unto almonds with a knob and a flower in one branch and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knob and a flower. So in, so in the six branches that come out of the candlestick 
and in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knops and their flowers. And there shall be a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Praise the Lord. Now, if you had been doing your math, you would have come to the same sum that I did. And that is, when you add that up, you have 66 sets of ornaments. 66 is the number of books in the Bible. Now, Psalms 119-105. And what's interesting to me is, it's just like the begats. There is nothing in here that doesn't have significance. That's right. There's nothing in the Bible that cannot point us to something more about Jesus. Mm. Praise the Lord. So he says, your word, thy word is a lamp. Yeah. Talking about 66 ornaments, 66 books of the Bible. The word is a candlestick under my feet and a light under my path. Yes. <laughs> All right, so it's interesting that this candlestick that represents the lamp of the Lord had the same number of ornaments that the Bible has books, right? So the candlestick then could represent the Bible. Yes. But here's the question. How can it represent the Word and still be a picture of the church? Right? Because we already know it's, it's a type of the candlestick represents the church because that's what he was standing in the midst of, right? Now we're saying it represents the Word of God. So what is, the, what is the truth? Is it one or the other? How can it represent the Word and still be a picture of the church? The Word has to become flesh again. There has to be a people who do more than just read the pages of the book. The Word has to become flesh. It has to take expression in us. Yes. Praise the Lord. We know, we've all probably met or heard about or read about or something. Theology professors in university. Right? Don even talked about a situation that he had in the class one time. Look, they, they can know this, but it's more than knowing. It is. It's more than just reading the pages of the book. There has to be spiritual life brought to it. There has to be something of God in it for it to come alive, for it to be more than just a history book or somebody's philosophy. So praise the Lord. That's what God's trying to get us to understand here. God planned for a people to come forth, this beaten work, a people who have been dealt with by the Word of God, and by the hand, the scripture says, of a cunning craftsman. Yes. This, this beaten work doesn't come from abusive beating by angry preachers. No. Amen. No. But it comes by declaring what the beating of Christ produced for us. Yes. Amen. What he suffered is for us. Yes. It isn't about some preacher trying to cause you to suffer to get you to get your act together. That's not what it is. The work was already done. The beating was already taken. Amen. And we are the beneficiaries. Amen. Of that. And if that isn't preached, then the church never gets to where it's supposed to be. It can never have a revelation. Amen. Or a manifestation of Christ the way God wants it to appear in this earth. The way it was in Jesus himself. You say, well, how, how can I ever be? He made you just like him. That's the yes. point. And what religion has done is keep dragging us back to the flesh, dragging us back to our potential, our failures, our abilities, and so on and so forth, when in fact we are supposed to be dead to all of that. That guy it doesn't even exist anymore. Even though you may see him in the mirror, he's not alive as far as God's concerned, and his, his opinion is the only one that matters. Exactly. Praise the Lord. So let's go again to Exodus 25. And... Verses 30 through 32. Exodus 25, 30 through 32. Thou shalt set upon the table shoe bread before me always. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft, his branches, his bowls, his knobs, his flowers shall be of the same. So the shoe bread goes right up within the light of the candle of the menorah so that they can see, right? 
And he says, and six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of one side, three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Verse 37 and 38. Thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. And the tongs thereof and the snuff dishes thereof shall be of pure gold. Now recognize, this, this menorah is fed by oil. Right. The center one is where they light the others off of. The oil flows from that center one to the others. Right. Now they have snuff dishes, and thereof the tongs are because they have wicks in them, and the wicks will burn up, and they turn to ash. So they put those in the snuff dishes and add the wick. So it continues to burn all the time. But they'll burn out. and Because these are gold, right? They're not melting like a wax candle that we would use. But the wicks have to constantly be fed. So when they burn up, they put them in the snuff dish. That's ashes. That's the ashes, right? So in the center of the shaft, the center of this candlestick was oil. And it was released to all the other parts of the candlestick. When the, when the wicks would burn down, they would fall into the snuff dishes as ashes, and they would, that's how they would keep it clean and keep it moving all the time. All right, look at Isaiah now, chapter 61 and verse 3. I thought about this because when we were talking, when Tammy was talking after Don had testified and talking about this young girl, and then Tammy referring to situations with young people, that if they're born again, no, they're not possessed. But they can be held captive. They can still be in bondage. Yes. Right? So it resonated with me thinking of the scripture. He says, Jesus, this is Jesus now who had found himself in the scriptures. And he's quoting, that when he does this in Mark chapter 4, I think it is Mark 4, he's quoting from this scripture in Isaiah 61. And here's what he said, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. Praise the Lord. The light, the beauty of the Lord. We sang that song about you are so beautiful, you know. Yes. That light, that light is what shined onto the shoe bread, which is a type of the word of God, the bread of life. Yes. And it shows the beauty of God. Yes. Right? So he says, appoint unto them with born in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes. So the wick burns up so that you can have the beauty of the word of God. It turns to ash so that we can get the benefit of that light. Yes. Jesus became sin so that we could get the benefit of the love of God, the yes. glory of God, the, yes. the wow. blessing of the Lord. So he says he turned their beauty, give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy that feeds the lamp, right? Mm -hmm. The oil of joy for the spirit of heaviness, mm -hmm. that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Yeah. Remember we talked last week, the garden of God. We are the garden of God. We yes, are God. paradise. <coughs> the place where God dwells. Yes. And that's what we're seeing right here. Amen. So there's only one way for the church to have an anointing. Only one. And that's when it's poured through that central shaft. Yes. That one that's in the midst of the church. In the midst of the candlesticks. Yes. Jesus Christ. He is the one who walks in the midst of the candlestick. Yes. And it's from him that the oil flows out to the branches to give us anointing. Yes. Which yes. then gives light to the word of God. So if you're just reading it, you're not necessarily giving light, you're just echoing. Yeah. But if you let the Holy Spirit deal with you, and that was again mentioned this morning, how many times we read scriptures and read it and read it and read it, and all of a sudden, bang, one day it means something altogether different. Not that the thing we read before isn't true. It's just that there's depth to it. There's meaning to it. There's revelation there that we don't always get. If we're not willing to apply the truth of Jesus' finished work to that word, then it becomes judgment. Then it becomes condemnation. But if we look at it the way Jesus looked at it, it's, it's a validation of our perfect condition in Christ. It's what we are capable of doing. It's who we are able, amen, to manifest, amen, in the, in the world. The light of the world. So the candlestick is to give light over against the table of shoe bread. Amen? Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The table of shoe bread represents...
the Word of God, or the manna that came down from heaven, which is Christ, which is the Word of God made flesh. Praise the Lord. So every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, all right? Another thing you could remember, we're talking about we're having prayer for healing here. Healing is the children's bread. Yes. We have it coming. Yes. We don't have to beg God to heal somebody. We just declare the healing because it's our inheritance. It's what we have coming. It, it, it's our bread. It's what we live from. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Okay, again, each side of the candlestick, it had three branches on each side, each with nine sets of ornaments. So keep that in mind. And remember, there are nine gifts of the Spirit. There are nine fruits of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Here's what we see in churches a lot of times. Imagine we have all the gifts, but we don't have any fruit. That's a lopsided candle. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to stand on its own. It'll fall. Praise the Lord. So if we have all the gifts and no fruit, we have out of balance church. A candlestick that's going to fall over. But fruit will balance the gifts. Yes. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1. Paul said, if I had the ability to speak with tongues of angels, if I could do, had all power, could do all these things, amen, though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am nothing but a loud noise. Amen. Praise the Lord. Without love, we only produce a racket. Yeah. Jesus came with all of the miracles that he had, they were all balanced by compassion. Mm -hmm. They were all balanced by love. We heard it this morning as well. He comes, comes to these people that are that are lost, that are without God, they're sinners, they're just like everybody in the, on the planet. And those who thought they were, were spiritual right. didn't recognize Him. All they wanted was the power. Yeah. But they had no concept of the love of God. And because of that, they were out of balance. And so Jesus comes in balance and He looks weird to everybody else. Because they're so used to not operating in that balance of yeah. God, power, and love. Yes, yes, yes. John 15, 5. So even Jesus said, you know, I, uh, I'm the vine. I'm the thing that everything flows from. I'm the central center in the, in the candlestick, right? And you are the candles. Mm -hmm. You're the branches. He that abides in me stays connected to that right. source of the oil. And I am Him, the same bringing forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And Jesus said Himself, without the Father, I can't do anything. Right. It's this connection. That's what the candlestick is trying to show us. Jesus is in the middle of it. Jesus, the candlestick is the church. Yes. And if Jesus is not in the middle of it, I don't care what's happening, it's not from God. Right. It could be exciting. It can be even powerful at times. But it isn't God. Because whatever God's doing flows from God to us. And that means we're not doing anything except staying connected. We're just believing that He is the source. He's the means by which everything is going to take place. Amen. If you take Jesus, if you take the Holy Spirit, and the leading of the Holy Ghost out of the makeup of the church, all you have left is the man of sin. Because that's what we were without him. Amen? No illumination. Only darkness. Only separation. No Jesus. No nothing. Yeah. Amen? Amen? I know with language, uh, double negatives are a no-no. Praise the Lord. <laughs> no Jesus, no nothing. Okay, well, if we feed from the table of showbread, which is the place of uh, uh, full illumination, amen, then we're feeding on the bread of life. All right, Revelation 18, uh, verse 23 and 24. Now, this is a church that's called Babylon. So it's a church that exists or existed and therefore probably still exists. And what Babylon means, obviously, is confusion. Sure. Right? Babel, Babylon. So this church is called Babylon because it's confused, because it's in darkness. And he said, the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. 
and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now you can come up with your own interpretation, but to me that's secular humanism. That's the world that we live in. That is generic religion. Yes. Praise the Lord. That's your theology professors. That's your universities. That's, that's the standard morals and mores, you can even say, that are in the United States and around the world and so on and so forth. Any religion, they're all going to the same place. You know, pick your poison, it's all good. You know what I mean? Or no religion is just as good. Just, you know, eat vegetables and plant trees. Good. I don't want to sound horrible, but I am sometimes. Praise the Lord. So they're darkened, they're confused religious system, and they have no candlestick to shine or to see by. No Jesus involved in it. It's just secular human. It's just their, their way of doing it. Their attitude, their idea of what it should be and how it should be. So there's no manifestation of Jesus because they haven't fed on the shoe bread, the bread of life that came down from heaven, nor have they heard the message that their old humanity is dead. Right. And that's what they're li that's their whole life yes. is living out of a dead reality. Yes. That thing doesn't even exist anymore in God. Yes. Amen. Revelation 18 and verse 7. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. We've, we've talked about that a little bit before, but that's, that's the spirit of Jezebel. But it's also a refusal to consider the death of the first husband, Adam. In other words, it's that generic religion that's just saying, hey, this got nothing to do with that. It's how much I do. If I do the right stuff, if I, you know, behave the right way, then it's going to work out for me. Or if I'm just a good person and give to charity, you know, or, you know, don't eat too much meat. You know, all, all the crazy stuff that we see. I mean, I, you watch TV, I, I'm thinking, where, where are these people from? It's like from another planet. Yeah. Well, they are. Yeah. Because the more we identify with Jesus, the more we're identified with the heavenly kingdom. And we're in this world, we're just not of it. And it just doesn't make sense. Exactly. You think, how can people be so ignorant? How can yes. they just not see what's obviously right in front of their face? Yes. That's like talking to somebody from so another world. Yeah. So he says, how much she has glorified herself. Well, if that ain't the world we live in, I don't know what it is. All me, 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 and more of me. Live deliciously so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, I'm no widow, and I see no sorrow. So, again, she's saying, I'm good just from birth. Just my natural birth, and I'm fine. I'm a, I'm a citizen of the human race, and, you know, we're going we're gonna to just make this thing better. You know, we, I remember in the 60s, we were going to make it better. We just got high and didn't care if it got better. Yeah. Praise the Lord got worn out and just said, that's enough. Praise God. So, so they continue to live a lie. Yeah. And it's the lie of the old creation realm of death. Uh -huh. yes. Praise God. Jesus said, when he turned to look, he didn't see Jesus. He saw a form of a man in the middle of these candlesticks. And he said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. I'm the first and the last. And here's what I'm saying. And here's to sum up this. We're about done. But God has a plan. It's a one man plan. In Adam, everybody dies. Amen. In Jesus, everybody will be made alive. Hallelujah. It's the message of Christ appearing in the midst, amen, of his church. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not saying everybody's made alive and they're never going to go to hell or, or have judgment. No, I'm just saying everybody's sin has been dealt with 
They've all been made alive to God. Now it's a question of whether or not they will receive it. If they don't, they just will be dead because they're going to end up judged as though they were still in Adam. Yes. Yes. See what I'm saying? God gave them a new birth, a new daddy, a new yes. progenitor, you know, a yes. new father. And they're saying, yep. nothing wrong with the old one. He gives them a new husband instead of being married to Adam or connected to Adam. He gives us Jesus. Amen. The bridegroom who stands in the midst of his bride or the church. And they're saying, oh, nothing wrong with the old man I had. I'm, I'm not looking for a new husband. Mm. The one I had was working. Right. No, he was killing. Mm. Right. And you didn't have sense enough to know you're dying. God wants to unveil his glory. Yes. Rend the veil. And he does it by pulling back everything that obscures the reality of Christ in you. The yes. hope of glory. Yeah. Praise the Lord. See, the veil now is our flesh. Mm -hmm. Jesus said the veil was his flesh. Obviously, it was the veil that, that had to be rent symbolically to give us access into the Holy of Holies or into the presence of God. Uh -huh. But Jesus' flesh was the veil that kept us from the God inside him. And that's the same thing that keeps us from the awareness of God now. Yes. And God wants to pull back the veil and say, that's not you. It's right. just a veil. Right. It's just a thing that gives you visibility in the earth. Yes. But there's a greater reality. Yes. A greater truth. Amen. A true identity that's beyond that veil. That's behind yes. that veil. And that is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Yes. The yes. Word made flesh. No longer a mystery. But now it's an eternal reality. And the more that the church realizes this and begins to walk in it, the greater the glory of God will be yes. revealed in the earth. Yes. Because it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. The only way that glory gets out is when we acknowledge who we are in Christ. Yes. Then the glory begins to fill the earth, the scripture says, as the water covers the sea. Mm. There's going to be a revival mm. that we won't even recognize it as revival. You know what I'm saying? It's just going to erupt in people's lives. People are just going to come to a revelation. We hear it all the time now about Arabs and different ones in the Middle East having these uh, epiphanies or, or you know, connections with God, dreams. And so it's going to happen everywhere. And the more we give uh, conscious assent to that and the more we give uh, you know, a, a, an encouragement to that reality, the more we're going to see it. Yes. My brother, I was talking to him. He, he's a retired cop and... Uh, Chief of Police over in Urbandale for 30 some years. He now works in the uh, the jail prison system as a chaplain, assistant chaplain. He goes around and teaches. He was talking about a guy. He said, "This is really weird." Now they, these are uh, kill the internet, would you? Praise the Lord. Uh, 